A very good evening to you. You're welcome to Ghana tonight. We are coming to you live from our news hub here at Adesawe in Kanda. What's coming up tonight? Let's take a look quickly. So what's the value of your money? Tonight, the finance minister assures Ghanaians the city is on its way to better days as he blames speculators for the dwindling value of the city. But what weight does this carry against your pocket? We'll find out. Also to come, the Electoral Commission makes a complete U-turn and announces a two-day extension of the voter registration exercise for those just turning 18. What stakeholders are saying? Find out on Ghana Tonight. Plus, our journalists here at Media General are doing great things and tonight we celebrate the win in solutions journalism as the Merck and Rebe Rebecca Foundations give them honours. Listen, I'm glad you're here with us on Ghana tonight. My name is Kemini Amano. First here, let's take a look at uh, the top stories in Ghana Brief. Voter regional executives of the Opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, are calling for the immediate arrest of NPP Director of Communications, Richard Ahiagba, for confessing and admitting voting in 2020 without having his name on the voter register. Speaking to TV3, NDC Voter Regional Secretary James Gunu said Richard Ahiagba must also be arrested for engaging in what he calls electoral fraud. Richard Ayaba, an MPP stalwart, confessed that though he was not a registered voter in 2020 election, he voted. That is another confession, and that is criminal. Just as throwing off, you know, dynamite. We cannot live in a selective justice system. So if Hobson Adoy is guilty, Richard Ahiagba is equally guilty of electoral fraud. More than 1,000 new registrants have been challenged by party agents in the ongoing voter registration exercise in the K2 South municipality of the voter region. The challenged applicants have been summoned to the K2 District Registration Review Committee, where some of them have had their cards seized after meeting the committee. Are you a Ghanaian? Yes, sir. You are a Ghanaian? 100%. What did you school? I'm sure. I'm from the cover. You schooled in Ghana? Yeah. You've lived in Ghana all your life? Yeah. You did you learned everything. The students who went in just a few minutes ago, when they brought in their birth certificates to prove their age, some brought in their weighing cards and the rest, their cards were given to them. <laughs> Private legal practitioner Kwame Akufu says that it is not necessary to go through an elaborate process to remove the special prosecutor if anyone thinks that he's done anything wrong. He also thinks that the Attorney General has done nothing wrong in the ongoing case against minority leader Dr. Kesel Atoforsen. I'm saying that the removal process for the OSP should not be as laborious as an impeachment process. The constitution has set out the persons, for example, who can be vetted, persons who have to be approved by parliament, and persons who have to be impeached when it comes to removal from office. An Accra High Court in Accra has ordered the National Biosafety Authority to label all genetically modified products on the market to enable the public easily identify and make informed choices on purchasing. Presiding Judge Justice Tetechawi held that claims by Food Sovereignty Ghana that the Biosafety Authority were producing GM products for commercial release are unsubstantiated and dismissed them. Tell you, when we start labeling GMOs in this country, no Ghanaian is going to buy GMOs. Our ancestors have eaten our conventional food. 
and we'll continue to eat conventional food until th thy kingdom come. Our lands are fertile, we can produce foods, we can feed ourselves. GMO is not the way to go. Who told you that GMO is the way to go for Ghana? Tension is rising on the education front, especially among pre-tertiary teachers, over delays by the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission in concluding negotiations on their conditions of service. The General Secretary of the Ghana National Association of Teachers, Thomas Musa Tanko, is urging teachers, however, to remain calm. The negotiations are ongoing, simply meaning it has not broken down and deadlock has not been declared. And so since it's ongoing, uh, we want, because of late, it looks like the agitations are, we want to age calm. And we also have taken the opportunity to, to call upon government to ensure that as soon as possible, this negotiation is concluded. That's Ghana Brief, a wrap of the day's biggest story, some of which we're going to delve into uh, a bit deeper. But remember that we are live on Facebook. We are also live on YouTube. So get interactive with us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, now X at TV3 Ghana. Tonight, we are putting the CD on a scale after the finance minister called out currency doom speculators. We are asking, what's the value of your money? That's coming up right now. Tonight, the finance minister has been addressing the media in what you would say is an attempt to allay public fears on the state of the economy especially the dwindling value of the city. According to Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, speculations about the Ghanaian currency is adversely affecting the city. He urged the speculations should be reduced. He's however assuring that the currency will gain more stability in the near future after Ghana completes its domestic debt exchange program. I mean, also said that the city will regain value as managers of the economy make more progress on fiscal consolidation and improve on the reserves over the medium term. Uh, yes, Ghana's finance minister. Cabinet has approved the plan for restructuring and recapitalization of the National Investment Bank. This will require a programmed equity injection of about 2.3 billion Ghana cities. And this will be done over the next 12 months. The first tranche of 400 million Ghana cities is expected to be transferred to the National Investment Bank before the end of this month. But there is more. Uh, the finance minister has also been talking about the third tranche of the IMF program. We want to take a listen to that. And then we'll, we'll pick up on our conversation on the value of the city. Take a listen. We have moved beyond agreement in principle. As of yesterday, 23rd May 2024, we officially received the draft memorandum of understanding from the official creditor committee. The government, therefore, with support from our financial and legal advisors, will quickly review this draft agreement with a view to finalizing and signing the agreement with the OCC as soon as possible. In the third, we'll talk to Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School, Professor John Gachi. But first, let's take you through a bit more of what the Finance Minister, uh, Dr. Amin, has been telling uh, the public. Uh, what you just heard is, the, is about the uh, the third tranche that we expect in from the IMF. Now, he said that Ghana has officially received a draft memorandum of understanding from the official credit committee as of May 23rd, 2024. 
Now, the allocation for the school feeding program, Dr. Amin says, has increased by 25% for the current fiscal year, but there is more. Now he talks about the CD. And listen to what he says about the CD. Really critical, because I'm going to put th that to Professor Gachi. Now, he says that the CD has remained stable compared to the same period in 2023 and 2024, losing 14%. 0.2% of its value against the dollar. Now, if he compares it to the same period in the previous years of 2022 and 2023, he's talking about a 20% uh, value loss uh, in 2023 and about 50% in 2022. And so for him, the CD losing value of 14.2% is an improvement. We'll take that to... Uh, you know, the experts on this matter. But the finance minister also tells us that the government expects cash inflows of $2.32 billion before the end of 2024. Uh, there's not much as to where that money is coming from, but what it will mean to our economy if we have it, we'll know in a bit. Now, the tax to GDP ratio is also projected to increase from 14% to 18% by 2025. Uh, you know, sometimes it happens. Uh, we're doing our best to read Professor John Gachi over the telephone and have this conversation with him. But you let us know on Twitter at TV3 Ghana, on Facebook TV3 Ghana. Let us know uh, how the, uh, you know, the finance minister's assurance to you is going down. Are you assured? Are you weighing that against your pocket at the moment? What is your CD telling you? In the meantime, we'll turn attention to the Electoral Commission, which has announced a two-day extension of the limited voter registration exercise. This is coming only days after the Commission swore it was sure an extension wasn't necessary. So the question is, what has changed? Stay with us for that. Now, the Electoral Commission of Ghana has moved the deadline for the limited voter registration forward, which was originally scheduled to end on Monday, May 27th. Now, this exercise will now end on Wednesday, May 29th. Uh, a note from the commission said on Friday, May 23rd. The Electoral Commission commenced the limited voter registration exercise on Tuesday, May 7th, ahead of the, the December 7th general election. It gave itself 21 days. Now it's added two, making it 23. Now the EC earlier said it was not considered in any way at all an extension of the period of the ongoing limited voter registration exercise. Uh, Director of Electoral Services, Dr. Sribwa Kweku, spoke earlier to TV3. Take a listen. We were expecting that the, la the lines were incurred by this time. But some people, you know, will always be the last minute catchers of the fish. So, and we also know that in the first two days, we had challenges with the registration because of the connectivity of the rest. So, more or less, we partially lost the two days. So, the next is. Let's give them the two days that we left so that we will cater for whoever may, might have been denying the registration because of the first two days, which is so that's the reason. If you have visited the registration centers, I would say about 90% of the places, the land, the land has been cleared. So we, if you look at the figures that were being churned out in the beginning, we hit almost 50,000 a day. But for considering for the last four, uh, four days, we are always operating under 30,000. So it means that the numbers have to be drastically. Dr. Sribwokwe, who there with an explanation for the turnaround decision by the Electoral Commission to extend uh, the limited voter registration exercise by two days. We've been taking this conversation 
uh, now to, we're taking it to a step further. Joining us first is Dr. Tanko Rashid Computer, who's Deputy Director of IT and Elections with the NDC. Uh, Doc, good evening to you. How does this extension come to you, given that the NDC is one of the groups uh, that had asked for it? Well, my dear, uh, this is not news at all, because we, my last discussion with you, I made it very clear that uh, the EC were in the haste uh, to announce that they will not extend uh, the registration because they think that they were within the reach of their projection. But mind you, as indicated earlier, they lost two days. Two days. The first day, that is the seventh and eighth, network challenge and breakdown of equipment, they couldn't register. Even a greater crack. Polyculity, they couldn't register one suit. So we we're, were all surprised when they announced that they were not going to extend it because you indicated you wanted to do 21 days. Mm. Now, when you lost two days, it means you are doing under 21. You are not doing 21. Right. Uh -huh. So that was our argument. And it appeared the EC, they don't learn from their past mistakes in order to help them forge ahead. That is why we are always trying to assist them. We are assisting them, not that we are attacking them. We are always assisting them to better our, our electoral system, to have a, the best of register that can stand the test of time, a register that is, uh, can save the purpose of electing our president and parliamentary uh, and, and, and our parliamentarians. That is, why, that is what we are interested in as a political party. Mm. And that is why we Indeed. are always on the heels of EC, to make sure that they do the right thing. And then, so it's a welcome news that well they've agreed uh, to wisdom from the NDC to extend. Absolutely, uh, Doc. The, uh, Doc, I do want to find out from you. The NDC had earlier raised concerns about irregularities regarding the conduct of the exercise, as we have more days now to, uh, you know, to, you know, do the exercise to register people. Uh, what considerations would you expect the electoral commission to be making? Irregularities are just unavoidable. They, they are irregularities that they should have avoided or they should have known. Because, especially when it comes to the figures, you know, as I always indicated, the figures are the heartbeat of democracy, especially when it comes to parliamentary presidential elections. Figures are all that we are looking for. And then, so there are something they should have perfected, they should have known that adding up numbers should not be a difficult thing for them. And that's why we are always saying that what type of quality assurance that they have uh, at the Electoral Commission, who assess the figures before they are put out publicly. I mean, these are things they should, they should, they should go back and do so searching at the commission. And secondly, we also look at the, 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 the BVRs that they use. These are avoidable mistakes because we have about 8,000 of them and you are deploying just less than 800 or 800 of them to, to go and do registration. It shouldn't be a difficulty. Actually, you would have assessed the best of them and deploy. So this is an indication. And they must sit up when it comes to December 7th, where they will be using the BVDs. We don't want to have that kind of challenge uh, during December, where BVDs will not function in the, in the field, and they, we have to be resorting to manual verification. No, we want. Uh, as we all agree that we want to use biometric processes in our electoral, electoral process. I we see. must make sure that the right caliber of persons are recruited, the right machines, they, they, they are properly serviced, they are properly uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 authenticated before they are sent out. Because Very well. these are the things they should Do have done. Doc, Doc I'm going to have you hold on now. Let's bring in Mark Ewuzi Akon, who uh, speaks for Election Watch Ghana. Uh, Mark, I want to pick your thoughts on this exercise, uh, you know, the exercise extension as well. Did you see this coming? Well, um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, let me say good evening to your chair's viewers. <laughs> I think um, we have on several occasions advised the Electoral Commission on some of the decisions it takes. Unfortunately, it never leads to some of the decisions we make. And for this coming to pass, it is never... Um, Anything so extraordinary because our projections indicated that indeed the number they have projected will be wrong and what we have projected is going to be right. So we are not surprised at all. 
Mm, I see. But what do you think about the number of U-turns the EC is doing in the course of this exercise? Uh, this, this turn around on this decision is not the first one. We've seen them put up numbers and then, uh, you know, come back and then take it away and bring us new ones. There appears to be some level of indecisiveness and a lack of accuracy when it comes to uh, the conduct of this exercise. How are you processing that as election watchers? I think that you have made some understatements that I need to probably um, 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 state it right. That the Little Commission's errors it keeps um, committing is not just by mistakes. We have said that it is a deliberate attempt to um, use the BVRs that they claim are missing because it, it, it's, it's very surprising. Very, very surprising that we are talking about issues of importance, which has to do with the verification devices, and the commission says no. And so you realize that the figures they keep putting out do not really tell you with what the political parties have, especially in one of the infographics they, 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 they posted. You realize that in Greater Accra, there was 981 registrants. And in the Upper West, at the East, there were also 981. But the graph difference, well, there was a very great difference in the, in the graph they drew. So we ask ourselves, if professors at the Electoral Commission cannot draw common graphs, can they tabulate one plus one for us? That is a, a worry. So for them to just say that they are very sorry for what had happened and that they have corrected their errors, this is unacceptable. Please, it is unacceptable. I mean, so if the commission does not work on its what appears, again, to be its inconsistency. Um, what are we up against going into December 7 and even on that day? Every credible election comes with accountability. And there should be some level of free and fairness in the election. You realize that the commission is taking an entrenched position, which to us as stakeholders and political parties, it is a very worrying situation. We believe that IPAC was formed by an act of parliament. And for that matter, we are also part of the process and then the decision making. Unfortunately, the EC goes in there to take their decision and put them on the political parties, which we have advocated and strongly you know, um, stated that it is wrong. We need to look at George Owen, but the commission seemed not to understand that. But you know, when it commits such mistakes, we need to let them know that mm. these are the few mistakes you have committed, especially when it comes to the statistics they are claiming they've put before us, that they are okay with the number of registrants they've registered this time. If you look at last year, the EC registered about 910,996 people. Meanwhile, they projected 700. Meanwhile, at IPAC meeting, they were informed that, look, your projection right. is wrong. And so go back and do them well. You understand? So we projected about 901 million. The Electoral Commission maintained... 700. When they went, they got 910,000, which was almost 1 million. This time, the commission is doing the same thing. Now look, in parliament, the commission told parliament that in every year, they had 550,000 mm. young people ten eighteen 18 years every year. And since 2020, they have not conducted any registration exercise. They started from 2021. So if we are starting from 2021, 2022, 23, and 24, you should be getting about 2.2 million young people wow. registering. So your data is between 450,000 to 550. So we, election watch is using 550,000. We should give you, in the space of three years, 2.2 million. Now, if you look at what the EC is doing, it is just targeting registering about 1.4 million, which is wrong. There are many people out there who have the right to be registered just Very so well. that they can exercise their fight in the 2024 election. Mark, quickly, I want to pick the thoughts of uh, the NPP's Deputy Comms Director, Communications Director uh, on this development. Harina Mohammed is joining us via telephone. Harina, good evening, and I appreciate your time with us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, but, you know, how is this development coming to the NPP? Jubilation? Um, good evening, and uh, I want to correct. I'm the Deputy General Secretary, not 
Security Communication. I, I apologize for that. Position for the past four years. Um, well, for us at MPP, um, we have always followed the, the registration process, uh, taking into consideration the various laws that govern registration. Uh, I have always said that the EC decision to say that they would not extend the day was premature and very early in the days to have made those determinations. I am happy that I'm seeing um, the results that they are going to do an extension because of uh, what happened in the first two days of the exercise. I'm just hoping that mm -hmm. with the addition of this particular two days, uh, uh, people will be given the more opportunity to exercise their right. We can't have everybody to be registered. We all agree. That is not the duty of the Electoral Commission to whip people from their houses, but to create the opportunity and the platform for people to be registered, and that's what the Constitution of the Republic has stipulated. I haven't heard the commentary that is made by my colleagues uh, on the side of this particular conversation, but we as New Patriotic Party, mm. uh, somehow, some way, we are much satisfied with this particular decision that we would Very not well. hesitate to call for addition if the need arrives at the end of the exercise. I see. I think the sentiments are generally the same, that it's a good thing that, you know, the commission is extending the exercise. But, you know, one other leg of it is we know the commission had earlier said that it was not going to extend to this exercise at all. Uh, it makes a U-turn only days after to, to do what it had earlier said it was not going to do. That inconsistency, some have pointed out, is a source of worry. Do you see it the same? I don't think there's an inconsistency. It depends upon the angle in which you are looking at it. The commission that has come out to tell you that we are open an exercise from 7th of May to the 27th of May, and based on the registration exercise that is going midway into the exercise, they still stick to their day. We, the political parties, have come out to say that it's too early in the day for them to say that they will not have an extension. There is nothing wrong if they say they will not have extension. And uh, for us to also argue our case out for them to come and then agree with the point that let's add the number of days is not obviously an inconsistency. Even though they have departed from their earlier decision, I don't think that we can describe it as an inconsistency. Mm. It's just that they didn't know what is ahead of them. And if they now realize that there is some uh, monumental work ahead of them in terms of people who are not given the opportunity to register and they make an assessment to agree with the fact that there should be a number of days that are added. It doesn't amount to inconsistency. It does that they have varied their earlier decision. Very well. Very well. Ma a very recognized decision. Mm, I see. Haruna, just hold the line for me. I want to bring in Dr. Rashid Tanko, uh, computer of the NDC doc. I was saying that I wanted us to look at the K2 South situation. Now, we here at TV3 have covered a story uh, where we report that over a thousand new uh, voter registrants in that area, in that constituency alone, uh, have been challenged. Uh, how does this come to the NDC? What's your comment on that? Well, we have our, our, our team of lawyers ready, uh, led by uh, uh, Tamaklu, AGG Tamaklu. Uh, in fact, very seasoned lawyers who are going to represent us at the DRRC, that is the District Registration Review Committee, uh, we have our lawyers properly trained, and they are going to represent us. So uh, we, we are not worried. We, in fact, we will make sure that the right things are done. Mm. If somebody is not qualified, the person is not supposed to be in a register. We will, we will prevent it. And if the person is qualified, why not? We will allow it to go through. And so these are the things mm. we are going to do. We are well prepared. Actually. I see. I see. In fact, all the DRSs, we are going to deploy the best of our lawyers. Very well, but the best of our. Team. Uh, Doc, are you a bit curious as to why there are so many, uh, you know, registrants being challenged in K2 South at all? Because clearly the MPP went on a spree of 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 of, of challenging. They, they 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 just ask their people to challenge whoever comes there to register. I, mean, I don't know what, what the intent I, I, getting from that. Very well. You, you, you know what, Doc? We're going to take...
We're going to take that, what you have just said, to the NPP and find out what's going on there in K2 uh, South. Haruna, you heard Dr. Computer. He says that the NPP is on a challenging spree over there, and that's the reason we have over 1,000 registrants being challenged. Your take on that? Well, you cannot approbate or reprobate. When you ask him the first question, he said that the team of lawyers are there to ensure that those who are not supposed to be on the register would not be on the register. And their lawyers will be represented and make sure that these are done. If you read the CI, the CI first regulation talks about members of people who should, be, who should not be on the register. If these persons are being challenged based on what the law says, it does not necessarily mean that uh, somebody has the right to ensure that this person is on the register. Mm -hmm. It is just that people are exercising their right to challenge. It is not about a party is deciding to do so. If you ask that the time for a seat computer, in the year 2020, before the 2020 election, they went to my hometown and challenged close to 1,000 on one register. That was good. They challenged close to 1,000 of registrants. We came to court. The same education he's talking about came to court. We flooded him in court mm. and made sure that due process was followed and these people were allowed to be there. It is not the right of somebody to decide. It is the right of the victim to so, 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 continue. So, Harina, I, I mean, uh, is the NPP on a challenging spree in uh, Ketu South? If you check the CI, who talks about the challenge, they didn't say NPP. They said any member, including even registration officers, uh, uh, any member or any citizen. Who no, I, 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 I absolutely who, understand that. Who, now, I'm coming in with your own logic. Hang on, Haruna. I'm coming in with your own logic. When you say that the NDC has done this in the past before, hence my question to you, would then, it, will it then be the case that indeed you are on a challenging spree in the, what, no, what would appear a, to be the World Bank? We are not, we are not on a challenging spree. We are just following the CI, which mm. talks about members or people who are not eligible to register. We are not on a challenging spree. We are exercising the right of the provision. Very well, one last subject. One last subject, and then we'll wrap it up on the voter registration ex exercise and election-related matters. Dr. Tanko, I come to you now. Uh, the NDC in the Volta region uh, has uh, asked for the arrest of the communications director of the NPP, Richard Ahiyagba. Does this resonate with the, with the regional office? With, with the national office, I beg your pardon. Actually, we have other uh, uh, legal uh, uh, means, legal and constitutional means to make sure that the right thing is done. Because what he did is illegal. It was right, completely right, illegal. Right, Doc, Doc. Doc, I think you're a bit back in our conversation. Now, I'm asking about the NDC in the Volta region uh, asking or demanding the arrest of the NPP's communications director for uh, voting illegally in the 2020 elections. Is this something that resonates with the national office? Yes, Kemeni, the gentleman should be arrested by the police. And he's not the only person who should be arrested, but the presiding officer who aided him to vote in the 2020 election. Both of them should be arrested and put behind bars. Because what they did was complete criminal activity. Because the laws of the country is very clear. If you look at CR 127, it is very clear. Under voting, who is qualified to vote? Before that, we have our verification process. Before you are, you are allowed to vote, your QR code is scanned on, on, the, on the register. Every register had, uh, this thing, a voter had his QR code attached to his name, his picture in the register. And so if your name is not in the register, invariably your QR code will not even be there. Indeed. And so that's one, 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 one slide. Doc, hold, your, hold of... your horses. Let's take that conversation to Haruna. Haruna, I, I, I mean, what do you think about this call for the arrest of the NPP's communications director? We, what is happening with the NDC is that they are thinking they have won the election. So they are making unnecessary calls. What is the state of the matter? These gentlemen registered in the 2020 registration period. Mm. His data is not found on the printed album at the time of voting. But his, his data sits on the national data at the Electoral Commission. 
the biometric verification machine had identified this particular gentleman. But when this turn around, the register was sent for the district assembly election. His name was not found on the register. When they come through the data, his data, his data, it's not found. Then he advised to go and do a new registration. He's not the only person. In Tamale Centre, if you come to a polling, an electoral area called the Assembly of God, we had 15 people who were rejected through this same process. The election, the registration officers registered from one particular uh, polling station. Very when well. they were moving to that particular other polling station, they did not collect the data and the name of the polling station. Mm. They went ahead to register those 15 people. When they realized that it was a wrong polling station, then they asked them that they have cancelled it, they should re register. Their name became duplicated. We have several other issues. There are several other officers I see. even within the NDC who uh, have this particular same uh, issues. Indeed, Let us gentlemen. Take our time and study the election process and all these matters. Indeed. Richard Aguanda is a good citizen of this country. Uh, if, if, if they feel that they are to make a call, we have competent lawyers and what are good. Indeed. Them. Remember, they have stopped him from registering. Very well. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid we'll have to end the conversation with both of you. Haruna Mohammed, Deputy General Secretary of the NPP, Dr. Tanko Rashid Computer, uh, direct, Deputy Director of IT and Elections NDC. Thank you so much for your company here. I want to wrap up the elections conversation. Uh, Mark Ewuzi Akon is with Election Watch Ghana. He'll give me his final words on what he's heard so far, and then we'll move on from this. Uh, Mark, you've heard the debate between the... Uh, well, my understanding is that, unfortunately, uh, Mark couldn't wait for us. I apologize for keeping you there so long. Uh, the debate got intense, and we had to uh, listen to that. But you're still live here on Ghana tonight. I see many of you are interacting with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Keep it coming because we want to talk about the CD again uh, when we raise uh, Professor John Gachi over the telephone. But right now, where are the projects? What a group uh, calling itself Northern Patriots in Research and Advocacy comprising of civil society groups in northern regions have petitioned Parliament and the Office of the Auditor General to conduct an audit into the implementation of what they describe as non-existent government special initiative projects. Now, that's a good one. Stay with us. Well, now, members of civil society organizations and beneficiary communities of governments, One Village, One Dam, and Pualugu Multipurpose Dam projects in, northern, in the northern region of the country have petitioned the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumana Bagbin, to conduct an audit into implementation of the special initiative projects. Now, the group say the attempts to obtain information about the projects using the right to information law was denied. The petitioners expressed disappointment over the poor state of the one village, one dam, and the non-existent Pualugu multipurpose dam, despite records of monies being allocated to executing the project. Now, uh, in, in a bit, we'll talk to this group. But first, let me take you through a set of the concerns raised in this petition and the demands they are seeking. Let's take a look. So first, they tell the speaker, we wish to point out that the Northern Patriots Research and Advocacy Group, or NOPRA, a civil society organization based in Bogachanga with funding uh, support from ASEP, engaged in tracking the One Village, One Dam expenditure and performance from the 2017 to, uh, to May 2024. They have found that all the dams are always dried up in the, re in the dry season. A period water is very much needed for uh, dry season farming to address issues of low agricultural productivity. So their question is then what uses the dam? Uh, and, and if this dam was there, it would be addressing food insecurity, unemployment, poverty and hunger. And it would have been in line with the policy objective of one village, 
Wanda. Uh, Nopra goes on to say that they have found out that on the average, 670,000 Ghana cities of Ghana's oil money was spent on each of the dumps. Now, they give the total, which is running into 18 million Ghana cities. And I want to get into a conversation about this. Oh, 381 million, 900,000, not 18 million. Three. 181 million. Let's. Now, I'll tell you more about what they're saying in a bit, but let's speak to Bismarck Adongo Ayerogo. He's executive director of the Northern Patriots in Research and Advocacy, NOPRA. Bismarck. Thank you so much for your company here. Your petition says that you didn't get the information you requested uh, regarding the One Village One Dam project uh, through the RTI. Why won't you just appeal, but you go straight to the Speaker and Auditor General? What are you looking for? The One Village One Dam and the Polku Multipurpose Dam are projects that we see them as having the potential to significantly transform the lives of the people of Ghana, particularly those of us from Northern Ghana and those of us that are beneficiaries of these laudable projects. Unfortunately, we have not seen anything on the ground. Mm. And why we decided to go to Very well. the Speaker of Parliament is that the Speaker of Parliament mm -hmm. is the landlord of all the people that we queue in the sun to vote for, to go and represent these, our so, so, so Bismarck, Bismarck, let's talk about uh, that going to Speaker of Parliament. What are the demands you make in this petition to the Speaker? What we want the speaker to do is to first of all, get all persons or institutions or actors involved in the execution of the One Village One Dam and the Colgo Multipurpose Dam to account to the good people of Ghana mm. what they did with the resources that were given to them. Parliament should get the Special Development Initiative Secretary. Ministry is no more there, but the Secretariat is there, should appear before Parliament to account to the people of Ghana on one village, one dam, the resources that they use, and whether there was value for money. Mm. One village, one dam had very interesting objectives. One was to ensure that we had double cropping in a year. Indeed, indeed. We were able to address low agricultural productivity. Indeed, but, but, but you say that cannot happen, uh, Bismarck. You say that cannot happen uh, based on your statement because some of the dams are dry when you actually need them in the dry season. But then you also ask the speaker to investigate the $11 million that has so far been sunk into the Pualugu multipurpose dam you say you can't see, we all can't see. Our government says that $11 million is towards bringing the dam into existence. Uh, your take on that? That is important because the Pualugu multipurpose dam, we were told the president brought the whole country to our community of Palugu and announced to us that it was the biggest single investment in the northern part of the country by his government and any other government in the past. Mm. So we're all excited because the Palugu Multipurpose Dam has the potential to ensure agricultural led transformation because if you look at the hectares that Polko Multipurpose Dam as plant is supposed to 
uh, uh, help farmers cultivate well. or crop or farm, it is huge. And some of us felt strongly mm. that with the Qualcomm Multipurpose Dam, if constructed, will I really see. significantly reduce poverty. I, I see, Bismarck, Bismarck quickly, uh, have, have you sent this petition to the Speaker and Auditor General, and what has been the response you've got so far? Right. Bismarck, I think we are losing the connection to you, but I'm asking uh, if this petition has reached the speaker quickly. We need to wrap up on this one. Both have promised that they'll respond uh, appropriately and that we should give them time mm. to go through it and then get back to I us. I see. So, so, so it means that, that you have, you have sent this. It means that you have sent this to the speaker uh, Bismarck, I'm going to have to say thank you at this point. Unfortunately, we can't carry this conversation forward any further, but we appreciate your time with us. Bismarck Adongo Ayurogo is Executive Director of NOPRA. But we want to tell you what we have picked up about the One Village, One Dam policy, as well as the Pualugu Multipurpose Dam Initiative. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what we've been able to put together so far. It's been a long time coming. One of the promises uh, the president made coming into office the very first time. Uh, we know that the, the president, uh, you know, in 2018, the Ministry for Special Development Initiatives in collaboration with the Ghana Irrigation Authority, Northern Development Authority and the Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies in the regions identified 560 sites uh, for the construction of small S dams, uh, 300 of which are currently under construction and at various levels of completion, and each was estimated to cost 250,000 cities then. Now we know it's about 670. Well, unfortunately, your system is failing up and I'm unable to bring you the full picture of where the promises began and where we are now. But be sure that we'll bring it to you on subsequent uh, broadcasts here on TV3. You're still live on Ghana Tonight. I hate to take a break at this point because I want us to talk about the CD as much as you're getting interactive on that on social media. Uh, but you know what? Let's go get some money. And then when we come back, we'll talk other issues. Don't go away. I appreciate you staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Some good news coming your way. Media General is getting results. Once again, we are sweeping key awards in solutions journalism. More on that right now. Now, four media general journalists have received honors from the Merck and Rebecca Foundations. The awards were in recognition for their impactful storytelling on health and women empowerment across Africa. Given in collaboration with the First Lady, Rebecca Ekufuado, the awards highlight the importance of collective action in addressing women's and girls' challenges. Let's meet the award winners. Uh, there's Emmanuel Samani, who's joining us via Zoom. And Stanley Nee Blewu, who is here with me in the studio. We know there are, yeah, there are two women also, um, Grace Hamoajima and Sarah Apenkro, who won in the maiden edition and she was inducted uh, this year. But gentlemen, uh, Ima Ima uh, Emmanuel on Zoom and Stanley here with me in the studio. You're welcome to Ghana tonight. It's been a long day for you, but it's worth it, isn't it? Sure. sure. <laughs> so I, I want to hear, what's, what's the story that got you the award? Okay, so um, basically, before I, I, I come to the mm. story, let me um, say that the, this is not the maiden edition. It started in 2018. Right. Yes. So, so which, that is the one that Sarah won. No. In? Okay. No. All right. That was, um, it started way back before Sarah won. I see. Sarah won see. in 2022. 2022. And ours is 2023. Mm. Yes. I see. So um, they have also um, opened nomination for 2024 as well, which will be held next year. So um, 
back to the question you asked about the story that won me this recognition. So um, it's a mission story I carried out in a community called Gundok. Mm -hmm. Gundok is actually a farming community, a right. deprived area in the Nabdam district of the Upper East region. And the first time I went to the school, um, just to, I mean, do stories about girl child education. Mm. So when I went to the school, then um, one of the teachers told me, hinted me that this is the situation happening in the school. So mm -hmm. I then have to delve deeper into what the teacher told me. Mm. So um, fortunately and unfortunately, I, there were four cases of teenage pregnancy in one class. One class. And out of these cases, one happened to be a child married, 15-year-old girl mm -hmm. who has been forced into early marriage by her biological parents. And so when I moved in to do the story, I then, I mean, observing mm. the lady or the girl at that particular instance, I realized that something was very wrong with her. And so I told the teachers that, okay, is there a chips compound around? Mm. And they said yes, a nearby. So they had to use their motorbikes to carry us to that mm. very chips compound for I a see. test to be carried on the girl. Not knowing, the test came out positive, indicating that the girl was, was pregnant. pregnant. Wow. And she was living in the man's home the, with the supposed husband mm. and has been coming to school. And the man, because of that 15-year-old girl, mm -hmm. the man has actually divorced the, her, her, um, his wife really? with three children. And the 15-year-old girl and the three children of the man Mm -hmm. were attending the same school. So the mother, the newfound mother, and the kids, or their children. Were in the same school? Same school. That's an interesting story. Interesting story indeed. Wow. And the, you know, the, the parents took 300 CDs, cola notes. To give, to give the girl away? J just, just that. Oh, my goodness. Just that. Oh, my goodness. And so, you brought light to, so, to that yes, story. Yes, and I stayed on that story. So immediately, I hammered on the story. Mm. Um, we had stakeholders. I didn't leave the story. Just the, I had to go to the district, engage the district assembly, the mm -hmm. DCE. I engaged the district social welfare. I engaged the um, Ghana Education Service Directorate. Mm. And you then, went all out. All out. And mm. then um, Ministry of Gender also heard about the story. And so they also sent delegation from Accra to the village wow. to dissolve the marriage. Wow. And so, um, I mean... Now, the results that we have mm. is that I followed up and I found school for the girl. So, currently, the girl has given birth and she is in senior high school. Well, good job. Good job there. But Emmanuel Samani, uh, who is also an award winner, is joining us via Zoom. Emmanuel, every journalist says that we don't, we don't tell the stories for awards, but it must feel good that you're getting recognized for the work that you're doing. But tell me, what goes into choosing the story that you decide on? Right. Thank you so much, Kamini. And uh, yeah, I must say this is my very first, uh, you know, award as a journalist since I started this journey some four years ago. And, uh, you know, when it comes to choosing the stories, it, it, it's all around us and stories that, uh, you know, affect everyone that uh, is not really spoken about. And so really uh, what I tried to do with the rest of the team on the health desk here at Media General was to you know, really figure out what stories are mm. quote unquote taboo topics that we can really highlight and shed light on for people to know. And so, uh, last year, if you uh, when you, if you recall, I did a series of, mm. uh, you know, fertility related stories and that's what won the award from, uh, longing for children, that documentary really, and, you know, fertility preservation for people to know that there are options for people who are trying to, you know, conceive and, you know, the natural way and they mm. are not really getting, uh, you know, babies and as such. And also just also to hammer on the fact that women are not just meant to make babies. They, they, they are also very productive individuals who do great things. And so maybe uh, motherhood or childbearing should not be a hindrance for them. And then they can achieve very whatever well. they want. Uh, in, in this life and they don't just have to be producing fantastic that let that be a stumbling block for them and so really that's that's what i put together in the fertility series mm -hmm. and uh that's what you know gave that uh first placed uh position 
terms of these stories that we're able to tell. So uh, it's, it's teamwork. And so really that's how we... You know, and I can only imagine that the future is so bright. What I don't get for the two of you is why you haven't shared the money that came with the award. <laughs> I've, been <waiting. laughs> I've been waiting for my check. Then my we'll share send, of the money we'll, is not we'll, coming. We'll send you more. That will come later. It will come later. Yes, for okay. party. We'll, if we'll if do you party. don't bring it... Uh, myself and Ghana Tonight's viewers will come <laughs> after you. But thank you, Stanley. Great. Thank you, Emmanuel, for bringing us great stories. And thank you so much for watching us today. I've seen the comments. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. I cannot reach them. But, you know, let's continue to measure our pockets against the value of the city. It's something that has got us talking. Let the debates continue in, in your homes until uh, there's a solution to the problem. I'm Kemeni Amano. This has been Ghana Tonight, and it's always a thrill coming your way. I hope to see you same time next Friday. Bye-bye.